Então, You guys are here, nice. Yes, we are here. Hey, Mata, yes. uh, about wait, this? five more minutes and then we'll start the quiz. So for today's, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, I can hear. Are you here? I can hear you guys very well. Yes. Nice, I hope you guys are having a good weekend because I'm thinking I'm gonna ruin it for you guys. Huh? This weekend- No, and but I have one question. Uh, what kind of quiz you want to provide to us? It's this what quiz about what? You said about a quiz. Ah, it's just a quiz about the last lecture of uh, segmentation. It's a very simple quiz just to give you guys grades. No worries. Okay. Nice. So today in this uh, lecture, we're going to do the quiz. I'm going to share the grades with you guys like uh, pers like uh, person by person on uh, Telegram. Uh, we will have a quick lecture about GANs. I'm going to give you like a small lab also about GANs. And then I will ask you to read two articles and uh, kind of a paper. And I will ask questions about these two articles and the paper on the exam, right? So it's going to be like uh, 10 bonus points for those who read uh, these articles to get better grades on the final exam, right? Okay, uh, what about, uh, you, you asked about the midterm and you, uh, you said what we will be able to provide some explanations to our answers to the uh, midterm, is it? Is it included? I tried, but I couldn't really upload them to Moodle. That's why what I will do is uh, basically you guys just send me a message on Telegram and I will send you like your detailed grades. Okay. So let's see, who do we have here already online? Yes, of course. So who is, uh, so let me see. Let's see, Ali, I will send yes. you on. Can you send me a message on Telegram just so I can send you quickly? Yes, for one second, please. Ali, there you go. Are you going to send answers or like explanation? Uh, just like the uh, per, this, there you go. Just uh, the grades per question. Oh, it will be nice. Uh, uh, I may find uh, information about the maximum grade for each task because this numbers is, is, is a grade, but uh, uh, you can't see it, them on the quiz. It's in the quiz. Ah, it's in the quiz. Uh, Imad, could yes. you also send uh, like correct answers on the not quiz? Yes, button? yes, right now. Right now we'll do that. Uh, okay, Mustafa. Mm -hmm. tuck, tuck. I guess so. There you go. Maxime. There you go. Uh, other guys, go ahead. Uh, send me a message on Telegram and I'll send you your detailed grades. Uh, can you tell once more what is uh, going on? Ah, okay, you, you, just, uh, you just arrived. So basically just send me a message on Telegram and I will send you the detailed uh, grades, okay? Okay, Anton it. Thank Igorov. you. Anton Igorov, you there? Huh, can't find you. I am a listener, I don't know. Ah, okay, got you. <laughs> so you, you don't have a grade for the... Uh, for yeah, the but other. I asked you before, is it possible to get grades, uh, unofficial grades? Ah, uh, okay, got you, got you. I, I will, uh, I will uh, check it. Sorry, I didn't really... Uh, I didn't uh, check your answers before. Uh, thank you. Because I did only on Moodle. Okay, I will uh, definitely grade them and send it to you, okay? Thank you. Uh, Ramil Hafizov. Imad, send me two, please. Uh, can you send me just a text and I will uh, I just read them? You. Sorry. I sent your text. Okay. 
Boris. Ben. Uh, Muhammed Ilyas. Uh, maybe go through the like explanation of uh, the great again, yes. Mm -hmm. Where is Muhammad Ilyas? Marina. Marina, Marina, Marina. Lucina. No, Lucina. Okay. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Nice. Also, can I ask you at, at what time we will have quiz? Uh, in like uh, five more minutes. Okay. Matt, I have a question for listeners again. Uh, was, would it be possible for you to send their PDF? The quiz, yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, how do you read it? So basically the first value is the first, uh, is the grade for the first question, second value, second question, third value, third question. Okay. Let me now share the uh, quiz. And we will go through them together. Mm -hmm. So the first question, first question was simple. Uh, some of you didn't uh, explain all the answers, right? So the first question has these answers, first step. So I just want a list, let's say. The first step would be, I'm just sending the message. Okay, Rodrigo, I will, I will send you right now. Is there anyone else who wants their grade? There you go. Yeah, nice. grades or... Midterm grades, yep. Yeah. Uh, okay. So per per answer, per question, I mean. So nobody else wants their uh, their uh, guy in Zoom chat. Who? There is a guy in Zoom chat. Can you send me a message on Telegram, please? Ah, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I thought I uh, gave it to you. I'm sorry. Dan, uh, nice. Let's start. For the first question, here it is. The answer should be the following. First, you need to speak about the conversion of the text into a vector of once. Then creation of data set, random data of ones and zeros vector of same shape. Passing the corresponding uh, texts to the classifier, weighting the vectors by their distance to the target uh, sentence, five, training a weighted linear model on the new random data, and then interpreting 
the model weights. Are you sure? Yeah. Second, uh, why do we use super pixel? And this, the answer is very simple. If we do the same as with text and convert an image into the uh, a vector of ones and zeros, we will have a very, no, sorry, by turning off the pixels, we will have a very large array and the linear sorry, model will suffer from dimensionality curse. Hence, we reduce the size of the vector by grouping the similar pixels together. So basically, if you explain to me just speaking about dimensionality curves, or just saying that the, the model, uh, that the vector will be too large, or saying that working with pixels directly is too hard, or saying anything that is related to this one, you will get the frog grade. If you say something that is kind of related, not correct, then you will get one. If you just leave it completely empty, then you get zero, of course, right? Uh, three. Can gram be used to interpret any class or only the predicted class? Any class. Let's write it here. A. Any class. B. What are used uh, as weights for combining the feature maps and what? The gradients of the average, right, of the gradients of the feature map, no, of the, uh, what is it called, predicted, not the predicted class, of the target class to the feature maps. Why? Because they represent the influence or the importance of the feature map. C. A problem arises, yes. So the size of the heat map is too small for the input because of the variance. Conv max pulling layers. Uh, what else? Yes. Um, it's done. How, how do you fix it? By up sampling. So far, simple. But in this case, like, uh, okay, uh, why, why is it? I have a question about interpretation of the first part of the third question. No, third question, uh, A part. Can get come used in virus and this any class is any class if a guy get come can uh, interpret yes but uh when we said like uh it, it, it's about like where it's it itself like any class or why are we working why are we working we just put one, one picture and we just take take the gradients out in the it's only with one class the data class will be used for interpretation i actually but questionable about the A part, like how to interpret it. It's very simple, actually. This is not about the lecture. This is about the uh, lab. Remember in the lab, when we uh, were specifying or we were doing grad camp, we gave it two features, uh, two parameters, two very important parameters. The first one is what layer or what layer output should it be using for the feature maps? The second one, what uh, class should it interpret? So this is why the question is about, can you use GradCam or, or to interpret any class that the model is looking at? Or can you use it only to understand the maximum class or the class with the highest probability? Mm -hmm. Okay, in this case, if I uh, properly look for your answers about the first question, actually the B and C parts are 
like pretty what I have answered. And okay. actually I have a grade of two. Maybe later discuss about it. Okay, we can discuss it later on. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, how to solve overfitting in CNNs. This is like, I think everybody got this, nobody will complain. So basically uh, drop out uh, regular, regularization. Uh, what is it called? Augmentation pooling. Augmentation. Uh, give me that thingy, batch normalization. So these are just four examples. You can uh, add as many as you want. For this one, as I remember, uh, it was 57, right? So 16 by 59.7. 59, so thank you. Yes, 59, 59, one. And the other one was, uh, can somebody remind me? For the max pooling? Should be 57, nice. Yes, yeah, 57. And just show me the calculations and that's it. Auto encoders variation. Uh, not, not one. It's like uh, the uh, yes the variable yeah. number of channels or one if you want. Just not three. Just any other number besides three. Because if you put three, that means you don't understand how the CRNs are working. Uh, a. What is the size of the output of the encoder? F. 2f. So f is here, like it's defined here as a variable. How can we make reconstruction differential? Uh, yes, it's called reparametri reparametrization. Probably I wrote it wrong, but uh, you got it, guys, right? Uh, following uh, question. Okay. Can you please uh, elaborate more about the reparametrization trick? Because I. Yes. Don't remember. Yep, yep, yep. Let's come here. This is for VAEs? No, this is for GAMS. Sorry. Let me. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Back, 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 back. Here it is. So this is the one about GAMS, uh, about VAE, as I remember. Yep, 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 yep. Where is the model? Variational encoder. Encoder. Yeah. Yeah, the sampling trick. So basically, uh, can you tell me what is the differentiation of sampling from N57? Can you differentiate the operation of sampling? Can you differentiate X squared? Yes, x squared, yes. 2x, right. Can you yeah. differentiate uh, a x plus b with regards to x? Yes, as well. Good. Can you different, uh, differentiate the sampling from n57 with regards to, for example, a? You can't, right? We don't know how to do that. So what yes. we do is we make this differentiation uh, happening by sampling from n of 0, 1. And then what we do, we take the number we get, say it's z, multiply it by a, add to it the b, and there you go. Ah, OK, thank you. So now it's differenti uh, differentiable, differentiable operation. Got it? Yes, thank you. Hello, sure. uh, da, 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 da. How, why do we copy? This one is also easy. You guys got it. Let me put it here. So basically, this. Improve the precision of the decoder, right? Or improve the uh, performance of the decoder. 
what kind of segmentation is made by each one of these. This is simple. Mask RCNN instance, semantic. Semantic, sorry. semantic and semantic, right? Uh, what does RCNN improve over fast RCNN? What's the difference between RCNN and fast RCNN? Reducing time by passing the uh, image only once through. The CNN instead of passing every region through the CNN. Here, removing selective search and or replacing it with region proposal networks. Why does classification, why does YOLO, why, sorry, country, why does the, why does YOLO do the classification on three feature maps instead of only one? To find objects. Scales. What, is the shape of the feature map. Okay. So this one is the following. Three times a number of classes plus uh, five, or let's say plus four plus one. Uh -huh. Multiplied by the following. Width divided by, what is it again? What are the different scales of fuel? 57. Oh, I forgot. It's simple. It should be just in the in the lecture. Where is that like YOLO picture? The big YOLO picture. They don't have it here. Thank you. Our friend sent us the answers, but I just want to find them here so I can show you where you guys find the answers. Let's go to the lectures, right? Uh, object detection, I think so. Where is the YOLO picture? There it is. Let's try 32. Thank you. Where is the answers? Yep. So width divided by 32. Width divided by 16 and 8. Width divided by 8. So uh, this is the uh, size of the feature maps. So it's going to be uh batch size width divided by eight multiplied by this one not multiplied but like uh, the other dimension the channels dimension and uh same thing for the height right so like this let's write it fully batch width divided by 32 height divided by 32 and the following number if you give me this answer, definitely you'll get the maximum uh, value. If you don't give me this answer and you give me uh, the calculation made, so some of you guys assumed width to be already, I think, uh, 400 something, and did the calculations and gave me the number, also correct. If you just give me this part alone, also acceptable. Uh, but this is the full answer. So I hope this answers the questions about the grades. I was very uh, like uh, grateful, like just easy with the grading. So I didn't really take a lot of uh, 
I didn't require you guys to put a lot of uh, everything to be fully correct to accept the answer. So I was very accepting. But if you guys feel like uh, you had a an answer correct and you didn't get the uh, full answer or full grade, just like text me later on and we will uh, talk about it, okay? Okay. Thank you. I will upload this after I just clean it up a little bit. I, I will upload it to the uh, model. Thank you. Uh, Tuck, 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 tuck. Now that we are done with this one, it's time for the quiz. Uh, this time we will not do a revision for the quiz since it's very simple. So I wanted you guys to just like get on it. It's just six questions, very quick, very simple questions. So I'm gonna give you six minutes, right? And let's hope things will go smooth. You can't see it yet, right? No, we can't. Nice. Let's edit the settings. Let's say we open the quiz today, 12.45. Let's open it at 58, right? Let's open it at 48. And we close it at 55. Uh, sure, sure, sounds good. Let's give a time limit of time limit of how much? Let's say six. Right? Da -da -da. Perfection, nice. Sounds good and strict. Let's go. Or don't forget listeners, please, Iman. Thank you. Uh, uh, I didn't hear you. Uh, could you upload PDF, please, for listeners? Of course, Thank yes. You. Thank you. Uh, show. Nice. Now you guys can see it. It will open in two minutes. So just go for it. I hope that you guys cannot see, see the question yet. But if you do, that's bad. No, it was OK. We can't see the questions. Nice. Explore questions. Let me see. Explore questions. What? Okay, don't get it. Yep, let me just remove the answers. Mm. What? Explore. I think you guys can start already, the ones with the graded, right? Let's see you guys are working.
Yeah, I think it was this contracts. Okay, I see that question two has an error. The first Bernoulli distribution towards is just an error. Don't look at it, guys, okay? So it's called variational autoencoders provide a Bernoulli distribution for each feature in the latent space. Yeah. Uh, sure. One, two, three, four, five, six. Good, very good, very, very good. Start submitting the great uh, the answers, guys. Okay. Okay. Doing well so far. Hmm. And second, guys. I think uh, we still have time. We still have time. Yeah.
Quiz finished? Yeah. yeah. Nice. May, may I show us the great answers? Yes. Great. Uh, yep. In, in Noodle. Ah, you mean, uh, ah, yeah, yeah, okay. You can't yeah, see we are not allowed. Yes, yes, yes. I did that because the I was informed of some bad stuff. Can you guys see the grades? You can change them while when it was possible. <laughs> I was finally still That was possible only in the first grade. In the uh, in the first quiz. I, first quiz, I made it so basically you answer, you see that your answer is wrong, you can like change it immediately. So no, yeah, <laughs> my my grade for first quiz eight of ten. Actually, I'm pretty satisfied with it. You can still reattempt the quiz. No, 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 no I no, said no, like no. I have not this responsibility at all at first quiz. I don't know, but when where you find this information, but I haven't known about it at all. Not sure. Can you guys now see the results? Yeah. Uh huh. Now let's go through the uh, answers together. Da -da 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 -da. I think uh, I should do preview. Preview start then. Share screen. But so auto encoders are form of unsupervised learning, semi-supervised learning, or supervised learning. Go ahead, guys. Answer. Unsupervised. Unsupervised. That's nice. But I was thinking about like if you're working with uh, smooth uh, like uh, noise detection and so on, it will be supervised because you 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 working with uh, reconstruction loss and so on. Like it may be yes. supervised. But uh, the official the reason I answered that it's semi-supervised. No, I I answered supervised because actually this case it may be the case. It's what do variational autoencoders do? Many things. No, but like the variational autoencoder alone. So what it is, it takes an image, reconstructs the image. There are no labels in there. But there is an image. Yes, but the image is not a label. It's only working on the data. It's super. Uh, it's unsupervised learning. Generative models, for example, GANs. Are they supervised or unsupervised? Unsupervised. Unsupervised also, that's good. So uh, techniques such as clustering, things such as, uh, let's say, PCA, all of these things are all unsupervised. And autoencoders are kind of the same thing as PCA. The goal is to reduce the dimensions of the data, right? Uh, variational autoencoders provide a Bernoulli distribution for each feature in the latent space. Is that correct or not? False or true? False. Nice. I said true do... because it uh, looks like Bernoulli distribution, I don't know. But uh, what is a Bernoulli distribution and what are the parameters of a Bernoulli distribution? What do we do? But we sample from the normal distribution, right? We don't sample from the uh, Bernoulli distribution. So this was just like a trick question, but I didn't think it would be a trick because like uh, I thought that everybody knows that uh, you're using normal distribution like N, right? The parameters are the mean and the standard deviation. Uh, VAE latent space is smoother than the AE for image generation. This is a question from the lab. True or false? Yeah, that's true. 
True, exactly. But why? But why? That's a good question. Let's go back to it. Why is the VAE latent space smoother than the AE for the image generation? Uh, how do we say it? You see, when we take an image, let me. Ah, we take an image, we map it to one point. From that point, we map it back. Uh, this point in the latent space has an image that's attributed to it. But this point, 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 all of its neighborhood is not included, right? So we don't reconstruct images from its neighborhood. So basically this point works well, the rest haven't been trained on and hence don't work well. But for the AE, you have the following. Let me erase it like this. So from a VAE, you will be, uh, yeah, you will have a normal distribution here around the space of that feature map, of that fe uh, around the feature space. So basically, all of this area, you will have like this. This is for one picture. Another picture would be like this. 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 And like this, we can cover much bigger area or we can have a much smoother latent space in here that we can use for reconstruction compared to the one that we have with autoencoders. And this is why autoencoders are not considered to be uh, data generators, image generators. They're only used for reconstruction, right? Sorry, let me clear. Yes. Ah, you want to say that one image is in variation of encoders uh, make the influence for many many distributions, yep. which are included in like latent space and actually like used for uh, uh, generation. And in yep. after encoders, we have just maybe like one uh, latent, one distribution and actually we just work with it and, and it's all. Yes. Yep. Or... yep. You can. Uh, we discussed this when we were in the. Uh, let me show you guys the image, like the last image, right? When we saw, this is the latent space of the VAE. See, it's much smoother. And then we discussed, why do we have this, for example, five and zero very close to each other? These things, we discussed all of these things and we spoke, what are the differences between autoencoders and variational autoencoders? Uh, you can, no. Why are VAEs not very efficient for image generation? So why are, they not like the current state of the art for image generation. What is their main problem? Ignore is it because the they ignore loss. part of their loss? Yes, because is they have three components. Let me yeah. just, well. Exactly. So is it because they rely on reconstruction loss? No. Is it because they no. don't have enough data? Also, no, because like they have the same data as GANs, right? It's because they ignore some part of their loss, which is uh, not differentiable. In a non-crowded setting, this one requires a little bit of thinking. This is the only one that requires something. In a non-crowded setting, meaning you have the objects in the image, not crowded together, right? Like this. You can convert any semantic segmenter into an instant segmenter by combining it with an object detector. Meaning we do the following. First, we, uh, yes, we uh, do uh, separate body of boxes for all the objects. And then nice. inside, inside these uh, uh, boxes, we do the segmentation. And, exactly. the segmentation be, and because of what we have non coded case, the segmentation will be projected. Exactly. That's the, uh, that's the correct answer. Let me do it like this. Add a little bit of texture. Actually, it was, this was my question, like during the uh, like explanation of uh, YOLO and the guy in after encoders and so on. Like because maybe you, maybe you remember you uh, provided us the picture of cats and uh, little dog, and I mm -hmm. asked you what like, actually if you will do this segmentation or in segmentation by unit, it will be a problem because the difference between two cats because they will be like considered less a one cat. And actually, what the boys on the which you're playing football is it also will be a problem. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. So, but uh, so the answer in this question is true. It's it's exactly. possible. Yep. In a full, this one was also easy. 
In a fully convolutional network, FCN30S is faster than FCN16S. So basically, FCN32 stride, uh, if you go to the lecture, you will see that it performs very, very bad compared to FCN16. And we said that we keep all of these different models mainly for speed. So basically, this one performs the worst, but it's the fastest. This one performs OK, but it's like uh, OK also in speed. And FCN8S is like the best performance, but it's the slowest one. So again, uh, FCN32 is faster than FCN16. Yes, true. Whee. Yay. Now let's, uh, okay, I am confused with the first question. Can you please explain it once again? We ignore the KL differentials part, but we say that it's negligible. Who says it's negligible? Negligible, what is negligible? No, like in, uh, you wrote that it's very little, we can neglect it. It's not little, nobody said it's little. It's very big, <laughs> but it's positive. Okay, so how when it's positive, that means uh, by reducing, so basically the following, let's draw it, right? We did the drawing, I cannot minimize Zoom or recording, okay. Uh -huh. Let's draw it again. We have the following, say that we are trying to minimize A, no, sorry. We're trying to minimize A, what is this language? We're trying to minimize A plus B, right? We, we know that we cannot minimize B, right? And we know that A, so this is a function and this is a function. And they are both functions of X, right? We are trying to minimize this sum. And what we are saying is the following. We will only minimize A since B is bigger than zero. What does this mean? It means that while we are changing the values of A, the B should not become something that is uh, negative and ruin our work, right? So we have the following. A is, uh, how do we say this? How can I explain this simpler terms? Mm -hmm. So the goal, again, let's start again. The goal is to reduce this sum. We know that A is reducible, B is not reducible. What we will, what we, what we will be doing is reducing A and ignoring B. So basically what will happen is the following. Imagine it like this, a line. We have a line. At this point, is A plus B. For example, this value corresponds to B, this value corresponds to A. No, sorry. So this is B and this is A, right? We want to reduce this sum. What we are doing is we are reducing the A. Let's get something in red. red. When we reduce the A like this, we hope that the total sum will be reduced. Did you get it? But yeah. we have no idea what is the value of B. So the value of B can be very big actually. And that's the, the reason why we can't really train a good VAE. Okay? Thank you. Adesha. Now let's go to the lecture quickly. Let me verify the... Quiz, reads, lecture, lab, and that's sweet. Okay, got you. So for the lecture, we will quickly go through a slides from this university. So this is a British Columbia University. It's a very good university. And they have some very good slides for GANS. Uh, since 
GANs will be like the topic of reading. All I'm going to do is just give you like the first introduction to GANs, and then I will ask you guys to do more reading of them and get better uh, understanding yourselves. So the problem with GANs is that we want to sample from complex high dimensional training distribution, which is image distribution in most cases, right? We can't do this sampling directly on the images. So we want to, do build, to build a mapping. First, we sample from a normal distribution or a simple distribution. It can be uh, random noise. It can be something like, uh, like this. Let's say we have a image, right? Send it through an encoder. We get some uh, distribution in here, right? From VAE, right? And then we take these values as the input to our GAN. You can do whatever you want, as long as uh, you provide it with a certain easy distribution to work with for the images, it can work easily. It, could, it can work very well. So basically we sample from a normal or a simple distribution, example, random noise. And then we try to learn a transformation from this noise towards an image. Can you guys tell me what can do this follow the following task? What can take a vector of values and give you a shape of an image? Just for the shapes, huh? I'm not speaking about like the content of the image or anything, just the shape. What can do this task? Decoder. One more time, may you please repeat your last time what we are talking about? Like, what can give you the Decoder. following? What can do this mapping? from a vector to an image. Decoder. Nice, good. I heard you, Maxime. I just wanted more people to uh, give the answer. So basically, decoder can take a vector form and then give you back a image, right? So this is what we will be doing. We will have something called as degenerate. What is the generator in the GANs? It's the same thing as the decoder in autoencoders. So it's the same architectures. Uh, yep, there we go. So basically, we will be having how do we make the content of the GAN good, right? So how do we make it nice? So what are the losses that will be working? To create this loss, what they propose, use another model or use another neural network that will give you this loss. So this neural network will do the following. So we have the generator. The generator is trying to generate images that look real, images that are similar to the training data. And the discriminator or this new uh, neural network will work to uh, distinguish between the real images that we have and the fake images that the, the generator is giving, right? So we basically have the following setting. Noise goes to a generator gives us some weird images. We call them the fake images from the generator. We have our training data set in here. And then we are training both of these, uh, this discriminator to discriminate between fake images and real images. So what is this discrimination? Simple uh, binary classifier, right? So this is a very simple neural network that you guys are already familiar with building. This is also a very simple neural network that you should be already familiar with building. Now the loss functions will be a bit tricky, but the, the, the architecture is simple to build, right? The goal would be to minimize this function or to play actually a game of min max objective function. So what we're trying to do is let's uh, simplify it Nope. Let's write it in a simpler terms first. Da, da, da. There are questions? I'm waiting for the meme slides. Yep. <laughs> Let's see. We have the following. So the discriminator is trying to minimize his loss, right? So he's trying to minimize classification of both of these images, right? Uh, sorry, classification of fake as fake and real as real. So this is the goal of the, uh, what is it called? Plus uh, this discriminator. Now the generator is working on another loss. He's trying to minimize what? Classification of 
take Israel, right? So this is his goal. Let's write it in terms. So this one, let's say the classification loss is binary cross entropy. Binary cross entropy between the output of a discriminator for uh, the real class, let's call it one, with one plus the BCE of Y zero with zero, right? So this is what he's trying to minimize, trying to minimize these two losses. This guy is trying to minimize the following loss, right? So it's BCE of fake images as real. So you can see that this loss is kind of the opposite of this loss, right? So what we have in, in the end. Uh, Umat, you wrote in the second part of the uh, binary cross entropy, you wrote in enough, you wrote once. Yes, yes, yes. By, by, yeah. Yep, sorry. This is zero. Thank you, thank you for showing. This is zero, right? So this one and this one are kind of opposites, right? So this guy is training his weights on minimizing this loss this combined loss, the generator is training his weights on maximizing this loss, right? Is it clear? Yes, yes. yes. So in reality, it becomes the following, right? So it's the uh, log of the uh, thetaized weights discriminator of X, plus the log of one minus the theta d over g zero, uh, g theta g of z. So what is uh, j theta j of z? So this is the input image, uh, not the input, this is the discriminant, this is the fake image, right? So this is the generated fake images. This is the output of the discriminator on that image. And we're trying to reduce the one minus this output. And this one is reducing the log of uh, the, the of the over the, uh, the real images, right? So if you uh, take the BCE uh, that we just described here and simplify it, you will get the following terms. Da -da 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 -da. Useless, 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 useless. So just to see some example of creations. So these are images created with GANs. Very good images compared to the quality of uh, the AE, right? Uh, tuck, 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 tuck. Yes, these are just some calculations on the latent space, but useless for us right now. Uh, the pros and uh, cons of the GANs, so they don't work with an explicit density function, and they take a game theoretic approach, so they learn to generate uh, from training distribution through a two-player game. So this is what we really are interested in. So this two-player game, the idea of having two neural networks play against each other. Uh, the pros is that it gives very beautiful and state-of-the-art samples. The cons is that it's trickier and it's more unstable to train. And here is your reading part. And it can't solve inference queries such as the P of X and P of Z given X because it doesn't use a explicit density function. Active areas of research is better loss functions, more stable training. Da, 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 da. You will speak about this also in your reading. And uh, conditional GANs and GANs for all kinds of applications. So conditional GANs, we will speak about them right now. Remember when we spoke about the, uh, uh, the noise that we feed through our uh, GAN, right? Here. So it, what if this noise was not really a random noise, but it was in fact just like concatenated with class label. So for example, here we want to say that we are looking for a horse. So we turn on the index of a horse and in the, de uh, in the discriminator, it's not going to be just doing one on the or zero for real or fake, but also predicting the class of the image, right? So let's say here it says it's a horse. 
So this is what conditional GANs do. So basically you give it a conditioned um, random noise, right? So conditioned with the class and he will give you, he will generate to you uh, the uh, image that you want from that class, right? So if you want a horse, he will give you a horse. If you want a dog, he will give you a dog. For your reading, you guys, I will give you two articles, 10 lessons I learned from training GANs. It's very useful. So it will speak about the stability and capacity of GANs, early stopping, why it's not something that you should do, the loss function selection, which we have seen previously, why there are not really much of a difference, balancing the weights of the loss functions, what mode collapse is and how can we fix it using learning rate. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, mode collapse is interesting and it's not that I deserve for one paragraph. It's complicated task. It's not it's true. It's a very complicated task, but it, they give here some very cool tips that you can easily understand how to use, right? Okay. Label smoothing, why is it interesting? Multi-scale gradients and TTUR. TTUR, I'm definitely gonna ask you guys questions about it because it's very interesting. Can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Uh, do you know some real applications of GANs? Not uh, what researchers write in a uh, trend uh, where contribution is important and possible applications, but something real which exists. Amazon Go? I think our friends at uh, Nikita and the other guys, they're working with GANs, no? Yes, Nikita and Arsenio are working with GANs, and actually we are working with style GANs, and actually we are like, uh, we are main product. I will not like disclose it, but it's, uh, it's all, all mostly based on GANs. Yep. Now let's go through a lecture of domain adaptation and what it is, and how can we use GANs for this task. And that is it, um, is it uh, will be about the cyclogan? Uh, should we speak about cyclogans? No, if you want. If you want. If not, yeah, we can speak about it actually course. if we have enough time, right? Okay. Domain gaps and domain adaptation. So, what domain gaps are? So, it's very simple. Uh, you can put it in simple terms. So, it's differences between data sets uh, that can lead to the model uh, performances being reduced. Uh, these differences can be huge, such as like uh, the difference between uh, paintings and images from uh, uh, ImageNet dataset. So these are real photos and these are paintings. The difference is very visible. Or it can be very simple, such as differences in lightning, brightness, uh, or other stuff, right? Uh, it's very different from uh, overfitting, which occurs between the model's training data and its testing data. So this one uh, for domain gaps, you have the training data, your model works very well. You have the testing data, your model works very well. When you deploy your model, your model doesn't work very well. So this is the domain gaps. Whereas overfitting, overfitting uh, your model trains, uh, your model works very well on the training data, but doesn't work well on the testing data. We don't even speak about deployment, right? Let's see what domain gaps, uh, how can domain gaps really influence the training, uh, influence the results. So let's say you are building a very simple linear model. Ah, very simple linear model here. So this is your training data, right? You built it, there you go. It separates the classes very well, gives you good classification accuracy uh, for the training. Maybe you have some samples for testing here and there. It gives you very good results also. The problem arises when you send it to the uh, target domain, which is like deployment domain, you can think of it, right? Here, the generalization that you made this linear model doesn't work on these data sets because it misclassifies many of them. See, it's a very simple decision boundary and it gives you this much misclassification. Now you can imagine if the decision boundary was high, which was more difficult or was more nonlinear, the results will be much worse. So this is what domain shifts are or what domain gaps are and how the problem actually arises. It's the difference in the data sets that cause such uh, problems for the classifier, classifier to generalize. The goal of domain adaptation is to make the training data and the source data kind of similar, such that we can build this cross domain classifier, right? 
this is a very common problem for all industrial models and the typical solution is quite expensive. Can somebody tell me what is the typical solution that you, sh that you will propose to solve this problem? There are three main ways. Which are? Uh, first, uh, the most expensive one and it's uh, like uh, the cancelled one is to move one domain, uh, data from one domain to, to be closer to another domain. It's like we take uh, images from, for example, source domain and make them similar by styles gun or in our guns to the target domain or good, vice versa. That's a good it's, method, it's, but it's one. Thing, but it's I want something extension. much simpler. I want something Simpl much simpler. Simpler is like, uh, simpler it's what ever from source domain and target domain, we take some features. It's as if we try to understand the images or our source of data from where. Something we, we, No, no, I, I say like, we may, may take these features and actually adapt the features, not the data itself. Gotcha, gotcha. So uh, the, typically in industry, you're not gonna be able to risk using style GANs or something like that. So what they will do is simply take this target domain, label every single sample in here, restart the training from scratch, and give a better model. Create another model manually. Exactly, yeah. So basically labeling and training new data. Uh, we can solve this problem or we can detect this problem using uh, using some measuring. Uh, we will not speak about this. This is more an industrial thing. I don't get it. Maybe just one can repeat. Okay, so basically, how can we measure the differences between the data sets? So there are some different statistical methods and different products. For example, IBM also gives a good product for measuring the differences between uh, the domains. I think uh, a friend of ours, I think Farouk sent us like that torch drift uh, library. There are many libraries that exist to detect these domain shifts just using the data directly without using any labels. So this is just for detecting and measuring the domain gaps. Uh, let's uh, speak about one of our ideas. Now the idea is the following. What we did, we did a small investigation on uh, a classifier that is trained only. Uh, so a classifier, so for example, an encoder plus a classifier for the connected neural network. And we're training the encoder only on the classification loss, right? So basically just using classification loss, we're training the uh, encoder and the classifier. We freeze the weights of the encoder and we freeze the weights of the classifier. And we try to train a decoder on the output or on the latent space of the images from the training data. Again, this latent space was extracted only by, uh, or was trained, or was extracted from an encoder that was trained only for classification. So the goal was not to extract features good for reconstruction. We did not try to extract features that contain as much information about the image as possible. All we tried to do is we reduced the classification loss. Uh, may I have this one more time refer to, to, to First one, you said about something really simple. I didn't get what, what, what simple way to do uh, in previous slides. I, uh, just I uh, training from scratch, just retraining the, the model from scratch on the ah, new this is a simple one. Okay, I, and here you want to uh, find the latent space. For here we are way. just uh, trying to understand the problem, right? So we have an encoder, we have a classifier. We train the encoder and the classifier on classification loss, simple. Looks so. Okay, Looks so. nice. Then what we do is we take the frozen encoder. It is frozen, the weights are frozen. And we try to train a decoder on it, on its latent space, right? Then what we do, we simply feed some testing images. We feed some testing image through the frozen Sorry. Through the frozen encoder and then feed them, send them for reconstruction through the decoder. And we try to visualize the reconstructed image, right? Theoretically, theoretically, the weights of this encoder were trained only for classification and they shouldn't be extracting a lot of information about the style of the image. So this is theoretically. 
since we are only training for classification. We didn't train it for uh, reconstruction. What we saw is the following. If we uh, applied some very drastic transformations to the test data and try to reconstruct it, we can reconstruct it almost perfectly with all the transformations being preserved. This means that the encoder was able to find information in the latent space relative to the style of the image, information relative to the uh, shape or the uh, transformations or the augmentations applied on the image. This is the problem that we are saying. We are saying that the encoder is too dependent on the data. The encoder is not learning uh, features or extracting features useful for classification only, but he's also extracting a lot of noise. This noise is at the core of uh, domain gaps, you see? So this is the noise that's making the domain gaps. The extra information that is not useful for classification, but useful for other stuff. Now the goal here, now the task that we are doing here is to kind of uh, eliminate this type of information. So we can eliminate noise information about like rotations, augmentations, background manipulations. Uh, for example, if you have information about the images, so for example, you have a data set uh, of uh, paintings on wood, you have a data set of paintings on rocks, and uh, you would like to eliminate the differences between the rocks and the wood. So basically, you would try to kind of uh, force the encoder to filter out any information relative to this wood or rocks. So the artist's methods, the doctor's background, the annotator's biases, uh, color palettes, camera types, brightness, color contrast, all of these are concepts or noise that will reduce the performance of your model or help uh, or uh, restrain the neural network from generalizing to different data sets. How can we solve this? Using adversarial training. So adversarial training allows us to define a thing that we want or a thing, uh, define a, uh, a problem and go against it, right? So what we have, we can define the following. We take an image, we want to do classification on it, but we can define some uh, concepts that we like to filter out of the information sent for classification, right? So we take an image, some extract some features from it. While we are extracting, we are filtering out information relative to the style, information relative to the transformations, domain specifics, supporting materials, art abstractions, historical biases. These are just some examples of uh, different concepts that you would like to filter out from the latent space extracted by the encoder. So this is the goal of uh, adversarial training here. So what we are seeing here is an example of an architecture that describes... How do we filter out uh, this? And how we decide which information to filter out? That's good, that's good. These are, this is a very good question. Let's see an example of how can we filter out and then I'll speak a little bit about what to filter out, yeah? So this are two data sets. You can see this is MNIST, this is SVHN. We send them to the encoder, we get some latent space, then we send them through the classifier, right? So this is a simple classification architecture. So far, it's very basic. What we added is a discriminator. Now, you're already familiar with the discriminator. Discriminator is only a binary classifier. Very simple. So here what we do is we take a latent space and we try to predict whether it's coming from MNIST or it's coming from SVHM. So we're trying to predict where, it, where did this image or where did this latent space come from? So again, this architecture is just simple uh, classification architecture, right? The architecture itself is very basic. Now the loss function is a little bit tricky. For the classification, we are learning to classify the images. So this, the loss function goes directly as it is. Now for the discriminator, again, he is training on classifying a latent space into two categories. So basically his weights will be trained on, on classification loss. 
Very simple. Now, how do we feed this discriminated loss back all the way back to the encoder? We don't feed it as it is, we actually feed the opposite of it. So the encoder is being trained on the adversarial loss of the discriminator. What does it mean? It means that the discriminator is trying to discriminate and the encoder is trying to filter out any information useful for the discriminator. Did you get the idea? No. The core no. idea. Yes. No. We're training them against each other. This one is trying to find some information useful for discrimination. And this one is trying to hide any information that the discriminator can use. Oh, why so? Because which kind of loss function are you used to? Power. Please wait. Uh, why we, how you, okay, the discriminator, you, you, you train it by loss of uh, source and target. And yes. what you do, uh, which kind of loss function you use for the encoder to train it, to train it uh, against the discriminator, how? You see? Uh, yeah. uh, where, where you find information useful for encoder to, to, to be trained against the discriminator? Binary cross entropy is used to train the discriminator, right? Ah, you force the encoder. Mm -hmm. okay. What is the encoder being trained on? Minus binary cross entropy, like the opposite, right? So let's imagine we are in this weight loss in here. So this is the architecture. The loss is like this. This is the loss for binary cross entropy for the discriminator. The discriminator is going like this to reduce the loss, whereas the encoder is going like this to increase the loss. Did you get it? Yes. Nice. So basically what will happen is they will be playing this min-max game. And in the end, the encoder will be generating images like this, let's, uh, I think we have some, yes, here it is. This is the output. So this is the output of the, the method that we just used. Previously, we had the following. So this was a zero from SVHN. This was the distribution of uh, a zero from MNIST. You see they're very far from each other. They are highly discriminatable, right? You can easily build a classifier to discriminate this one and this one. Okay, after, yes. we apply, after we apply the, uh, the uh, domain adaptation method, we get the following. The zero from MNIST and the zero from SVHN are much closer to each other. They're kind of overlapped, overlapping with each other. Same thing for the MNIST and SVHN for five, same thing for three, same thing for eight, same thing for two. And, now the uh, goal is, let's see. Imagine you are building a classifier using only the M, okay. So let's say the classifier will say these points are two, these points are one, these points are seven, these points are eight, these points are nine. So this is the decision boundary, okay? Now we are building a classifier using only M. Huh? We don't see S. So S does not, uh, the classifier does not see S, okay? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Nice. So you can see here for the M, he was able to detect some of these S, but you see this huge blob of ones with different style that was not classified as one, that was misclassified. Same thing for a two. Since he didn't see that there are two like this, he will not be able to build a good classifier for the two. And basically there will be lots of misclassifications here, lots of misclassifications here. Same thing for the nine, a lots of misclassifications here. But when they are cleaner and relatively clustered together, the classifier can easily generalize like this. Generalize like this. Generalize like this. So it, theoretically, it's much easier for a classifier to do better job on both domains if they are closer together. Did you get it? Yes. 
parachute. So this is what domain adaptation is. Domain adaptation allows you to build better inter-domain classifiers. So build a classifier that is able to train, that is able to classify or to detect images from both domains using the labels of only one domain. Uh, may I have a question? Uh, here in this example, the uh, latent space is uh, two dimensional, right? Like, uh, how, how did you draw this? Uh... TSNE, it's called TSNE. Oh, okay. TSNE is a method similar to PCA, but it preserves these manifolds a lot. So basically, TSNE is very important for preserving the manifold structures, it's useful for preserving the neighborhoods. Another architecture is the following. So we will go through this very quickly. We have an encoder classifier. We're training the encoder to reduce the classification loss very well. We have a decoder. Here it is, reconstructing the images. The, re, uh, the decoder is training to reduce this the reconstruction loss, right? Whereas the encoder is training to increase that reconstruction loss. So basically what we are saying is we want the encoder to filter out any information useful for reconstructing all the details of the uh, of the input image, right? So basically, again, what we said is the style of the image and the details of the image is noise for classification. It's not something we would like to keep inside our latent space. How do we do that? We train a decoder. The decoder is trying to re reconstruct the input images, and we try to re uh, to go in the opposite direction of the encoder to uh, improve its ability to generalize to different data sets. Did you guys get it? The core idea. One more, one more time, please. One more time. One more time. So here we have an encoder trained with a classifier. We're trying to reduce the classification loss. Very easy, something that you guys are already familiar with. We try to improve this further by doing the following. We take a latent space, decode the image into the input image. So we try to get this reconstructed image. The decoder is again trained on decoding, the, trained on reconstruction loss, normal. Everything is normal here. The only thing that is different is how is the decoder influencing the encoder. The decoder is uh, the decoder loss is being inversed and then sent for the encoder. So basically, the encoder tries to reduce reconstruction loss. Encoder tries to augment the reconstruction loss. OK? So they're playing min, max game in here. And the overall goal is to make sure that the features or the latent space of Z is not useful for reconstruction, meaning it does not contain information about the style of the image. It's like we will see this. The model tries to uh, keep as much, as less information as possible. Exactly. Keep only information for classification. Anything else, ignore it. Uh, let's see. Let's see. So this is the same experiment we did before, but now. The encoder was trained on that adversarial loss, right? So uh, once we finished, we froze the weights of the encoder, freeze the weights of the classifier, train a new decoder to reconstruct the images. And now you can see we cannot really reconstruct the images completely. Meaning we don't have in the latent space information useful for completely reconstructing the image. So we still have some. So for example, you see this zero is not completely linked. The reconstructed zero is also not completely linked. So there is still some information that is leaking, but it is less. This allows the model to perform much better results. Sorry. This allows the model to perform much better results at classification, both for the source data and for the target data, both for training and deployment. Adversarial training, again, is not the only solution for uh, domain adaptation. There are many tricks and heuristics that you can apply that are uh, some mathematical losses and your networks. We can see an example in here. So this was a recent paper. What they do is 
They simply take an image, train an object classifier on that image. And then what they do is they generate this, uh, what is it called? Jigsaw puzzle. You guys, are, you guys know what jigsaw puzzles are? Yes. It's a game, right? So these games. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where you just inverse some parts of the uh, of the image, and they ask the a, a, another called a jigsaw classifier to kind of solve this jigsaw puzzle. Sorry. So basically, they solve the jigsaw puzzle that they created. Is this supervised or unsupervised? So basically, we have a classifier, jigsaw classifier. Only this part. Is it a supervised training or unsupervised? We get for labels. What, what are the labels being used? Uh, yes, the, labels of images? Supervised. the labels are being used here. Now I am speaking about this part only. If we look at this part only. It looks like unsupervised. It's completely unsupervised, right? We take data, shuffle the image, and then create our own labels from that image. So this is not uh, a supervised learning. This is an unsupervised learning. Everything uh, is being generated from the data itself. So what we specify do? We specify try to understand what is actually a horse on shuffled image or what? Uh, which one? The jigsaw classifier? Yes, jigsaw. Yeah, he's trying to solve it. He's trying to go from this image back to this image. Uh -huh. You see? He's trying to uh -huh. go from this image back to the original. He's trying to solve that jigsaw puzzle. Okay. And it helps? Yes, it helps. This is an idea that helps. This <laughs> okay. is a heuristic that helps. Another one would be uh, this one. In here, what we did is, uh, are you guys familiar with LDA, linear discriminant analysis? Yes, we had a course. Nice. So uh, similarly to LDA, what we did is we take the center of uh, the seven from MNIST and we take the center of a seven from SVHN. One question would be, we don't have the labels for the deployment data. We'll speak about that later. But imagine that we have the labels for the deployment and we have the labels for the, the training. What we do is we reduce the distance in the latent space between the training and deployment of the same class. OK, so this is why we have this clustering here. Nice. How do we get the labels? This is a good question. The question is called pseudo labeling. So what we do is we take the deployment image, send it to our already pre-trained classifier. If the classifier tells you this is a dog with 99% uh, sure, like probability, then we consider it as a correct label. If he says this is a dog, but with like 60 or 70% probability, we ignore this sample completely. So these are pseudo labeling. So pseudo labeling is a technique also used in domain adaptation. It helps to improve the results of the model. So far, so good. Okay, I'm gonna ask. Yeah. Uh, like yes, I have a question. Which is, okay, what what happens if I just combine all data in the one class without having this interclass uh, uh, training? Good question. So basically, imagine that you just had uh, the labels for MNIST and the labels of SVHN, right? Yes, yes. And both the labels are under the same class. So there's no, there's no, they are all combined in the same data set. This kind of model is called deep all model. Uh, I would go through some paper papers that I already uh, published, but I'm not really sure that we can easily find them. But we have this deep all model. So basically, we take the uh, samples from MNIST, we take the labels from the other domain, make this one data set and send it through classification. Let's say that you get 97% uh, accuracy. If you use these techniques for domain adaptation, you would get around like 99% accuracy. You see? Why? It's because you are adding more information to the training. Okay, so why why are we doing all this? Uh, why it doesn't also work for GANs or? 
because yeah, it's basically it. also training a discrimination and uh, it's, it's, it's a normal neural network like others. Like, I mean, why are we going through all this pain for domain adaptation? Oh, because we don't have the labels for the deployment. You see? The deployment data. Ah, right? ah, so this is like a probability distribution based on like pure... Uh, yeah, this is toy data Coding sets. without labels here. Mm, okay, okay. Yeah, this is just toy data sets, so we have the labels. But when do you need to use domain adaptation? You need to use it when you are in like industry and you don't have the labels for that data. Mm, interesting. So basically the deep all model cannot be used. So you cannot just combine your training data with the deployment data and like make one data set because you don't have the labels for the other one. And labeling is sometimes very expensive. So for example, if you have the medical images in order to relabel from scratch, you're gonna need lots of doctors. You're gonna need lots of like uh, processes. You're gonna need to sign lots of uh, documents. It's just a lot of pressure, right? Uh, this is why domain adaptation, what it tells you, just give me the data as it is without any labels and I will try to do my best. Okay, so we can see some results here. Let's see, MDPI. Just to see some results of how does it improve. There you go. I think zero. So here you can see, this is called the, the fully the deep convolutional neural network trained on the deployment data only. So it gives you some very good results, right? If you have the labels, you still get some very good results. If you don't have the labels, so you train only on the source, Check what is the accuracy, 62. It drops significantly. Now, the task that we are trying to do is the following. We're trying to raise this 62 all the way up to 98, for example, from 62 up to 98% without having any labels for the deployment data. So this is the, the thing you get from using domain adaptation. A huge increase in accuracy for a huge increase in performance on deployment without having any labels for the deployment data. Did you get it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Do you guys have any questions? I what, uh, what what means deployment? Uh, you use this term, but I actually like uh, questionable about, about what means deployment. Data? Deployment, deployment is just you can imagine it in a scenario like a fake scenario for research. For you, for research, it will be like this. This is training. This is deployment. So just different data sets for you for research. Now, for somebody who's working in like industry, what you will have deployment. Uh, the training data is the training data that you use. Deployment data is the data the model will be doing inference on. So for example, you have a model for uh, like rating Airbnb uh, images, right? You take Airbnb image and you see it. You trained it on the Airbnb data from 2005, 2006, right? So these two years are your training image, the uh, training data. The deployment data is the images, for example, of 2021. So you deploy your model on 2021. Now your model is seeing new images, new data. This is the data of deployment, right? Did you get it? Okay, yes, yes, yes. Nice. Do you guys have any questions so far about like the, the next week? Ah, about the next week, you said we need to go for two papers and you actually pub uh, published only one one. one, one. Maybe send the links to the chat, like to, to, I will not send it on the chat. I will send it on Moodle, like just like a small uh, task. You guys will read them. Very simple, very basic. Just try to understand them as much as possible. I will give on them two bonus points, two bonus questions. There will be bonus points. So it's not something that's uh, under the 100%. It's just bonus points if you want to get better results on the final exam. And uh, this final exam will be long for 
uh, how many hours? And actually, do you have like some lecture before it or lecture after it? No. The final exam will be on uh, next week, on Saturday. And we will not have any lecture before it. We will not have any revision before it. It will be closed book. So we will not have any internet, any lecture notes, anything. It will be a little bit easier than the midterm. But again, it will be completely uh, on paper, no internet, no books, no nothing. Uh, is there a class next Friday? Uh, next Friday, there will not be any class. So basically we will have the final exam and then I will ask you guys to do the presentations of your final project. After exam, you mean? I'm not sure, after exam or be, uh, before the exam? What do you, which one do you prefer? I prefer after I the exam. I think both rounds are not so good because like we need some time to like to take a rest after exam. Uh, for some people, it's good to move to home after exam. Okay, got you. So let's do the following. I will postpone the final exam. Should we postpone the final exam or should we postpone the uh, project presentations? Project presentations. Project presentations. Project presentations. So you want uh, the final exam next week, project presentations after it with one week, right? Yes. Yes. Perfect. That would be amazing. Yes. So basically, next week you will have just one lecture for the final exam. You study that lecture. And after that, with one week, we will have the final uh, the presentations. If somebody was like, is like, I don't want to come another week and I want to finish it now, you can present to me on the next week after we finish the final exam, okay? Uh, can I ask? Uh, so final exam covers all content of the course, yeah? All content of the course, yep. Both labs and the uh, lectures. Uh, can you share some uh, good or quick tutorial about uh, deploying uh, a model using Docker? Like how, how to we will, we will do that uh, after the final exam, after we finish the presentations, we will have a quick uh, overview about how to use Docker, how to use, for example, RESTful APIs, how to make your uh, the size of your model a bit smaller. All of these, we will have like a small quick tutorial on all of them. Okay. Yeah, I questions for yes. next week we have uh, one lecture length exam yes. and we need to finish uh, the third homework for this yes time. yes the and, homework uh, is easy. after exam we will have a final presentation yes exactly and for uh, the exam like we will have it like the midterm we need to be in Annapolis in the summer. yes Yes. But this time, exam is closed book and so on. Yes. Let me just write them into the chat. And about time, which time? Uh, which one do you guys prefer? Do you want it early in the morning? Do you want it uh, like the last lecture? This this one depends on you guys. I will send Maybe a poll. Send third. Let's poll. Okay, I think. Yeah, I will send a poll, and you have like the three uh, times of the lectures, right? So basically, at ten. Okay. Yeah, so either at 8, 10, or 12. 10, definitely 10. So next week, we will have an exam closed book. Uh, can I ask some questions if we still have time? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, just a quick question. I, I want to make sure, like we have in uh, YOLO or data. Detector uh, AB at uh, 50 and AB at 75. So 50 and 75 are the IOU thresholds, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, another question I want to ask you about is uh, a bit technical. So, uh, like, let's say in the development process, we basically train on the training set and we test on the validation set and we tune the hyperparameters. Okay. Then I can't hear you very well. Uh, I'm saying in the development process, where yes. when we are developing the model and uh, tuning the hyperparameters, we yes. train on the training set and test on the validation set or yes. evaluate on the validation set. Yes. Uh, then when we want to finalize the results, we yes. uh, test on the testing plus validation and, uh, and evaluate on the test. Then when we, want to, when we want to deploy it, we want test plus validation plus testing and then deploy it. Uh, no, when you do the uh, hyperparameter tuning, 
you only use the validation data set. Once you select your best model, you test it once on the test data set and send it through the uh, send it yes. through the process. So, so what I'm saying is that when we want to test it, like we train the model on training plus validation, because like uh, why use twenty percent? Ah, yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Okay, and when we we are deploying, uh, we basically train the model on all of the data, train plus validation plus testing. No, no. Uh, let's say that we want to deploy the model. What, why not train it? On all theoretically, the theoretically, yes. Theoretically, adding more data to the training should not decrease the results. But if you don't have like that value that tells you, yes, you don't have the test data, you cannot deploy it. Even though theoretically, what you are saying is good, but it, uh, it's not, it's very risky, you know? Uh, okay, so like let's say that the question is abstract because uh, in some cases, like we want to do that because it's kind of a simple uh, situation. My question is, uh, do we have some tool to automate this? Like when we say test, it uh, automatically trains on the training plus validation and tests on the test when we are developing. Uh, so we basically have three variants. So it's kind of hard to implement from scratch using kind of, do we have something like uh, that's easy that does this? I personally don't recommend it. I mean, theoretically you are speaking correctly. So abstract, if you speak in an abstract fashion, yes. But if you're going to do this in like, a, like you're going to deploy it on the industry, you shouldn't do this. You really shouldn't do this. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. If I got your uh, your questions correctly, you can text me later, and we will speak about it in more detail. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh -huh. uh, Matt, may I ask one question? Yes, it's about the uh, revision of the midterm. May I like uh, type, type, type you in a private message, and we may decide when we may discuss these things. Okay. Just uh, if you have any questions about like the final exam about these things, you can ask now. If you have questions about like uh, general stuff or about the homework. Just text me and I will reply to you guys, okay? Uh, maybe about final exam, we will do like a review lecture before, why not? Like We talk. can do that if you want. Do you guys need a quick uh, revision lecture for the final exam? I think this will be okay, yes. Okay, we can do one, yes. We will do one lecture before it and then the final exam. Sounds fun? Yes, sounds good, yeah. Do you guys have any other questions? Only about midterm, but we can discuss it in privately. Okay. See you guys. Good luck and prepare very well. Don't forget your homework and uh, see you next week. Thank you. And see, see you guys. Bye. Bye. -bye.